All right. Thanks to all for being here. This is uh, special, I feel like, this year, particularly just with the Rise Shine, um, just really honing in on the focus and theme of praying in Presence Church and what that means and, and uh, what that looks like. And so it's something that's been in my heart for a long time. If you don't know me, my name's Caleb. Uh, I'm the worship and prayer pastor here at Radiant Church. Been here a little over five years and... Uh, Yep. First, I want to say hi. My mom and dad are in the room after Brent and Georgia Culver over here. The OGs, still pastoring upstate New York. Uh, Christine, the worship leader, is here as well. Um, but, you know, this was something that uh, Pastor Lee was really adamant when he hired me that I wasn't just the worship pastor, that I was the worship and prayer pastor, which, you know, might not have made a ton of sense at the time, but, you know, this was a vision I remember Pastor Lee showing me uh, in his notebook. He had this drawing. At the time, Radiant Church, um, it was the network, but within the city, it was just one location, the one you're here at in Richland, um, and uh, now it's three locations, but he, he drew this building, this three-story building, um, just in the heart of the city, and At the top, he had this uh, prayer center, and then kind of this main level was like coffee shop and offices and whatever, and then in in the lowest level, there was like a a ministry training school, and and, uh, he's like, I feel like the Lord just kind of showed me a vision of kind of where we're going, and, you know, I know we could kind of plant a ton of churches um, and kind of go, you know, focus on that, uh, you know, adding a bunch of campuses, but, you know, I felt like the Lord saying, hey, pause till you really get prayer at the center. Um, And just to even invest, you know, I love hearing Pastor Lee's heart this morning, and it's not just something he's saying with his mouth. I mean, we as an organization, you know, investing literal literal millions into something that provides no monetary return. (laughs) You know, like prayer is the, the stupidest strategy as far as like church growth. And there's a reason why any like church growth methods and whatever tell you to avoid prayer. (laughs) But, uh, but if you want, um, if you want to, uh, if you want to sustain what you're doing, if you want the, the heartbeat to be there, and that's kind of what we describe prayer and worship as the heartbeat of the church, and you know, you, the mouth is is um, you know that's the mouthpiece, that's the messaging, that's the preaching. Um, the feet represent the body going and reaching the lost. The hands represent the healing, uh, the ministry to the poor and and the hurting. And then prayer is the heart. It's it's unseen. You you can't see it at the surface. You can't look at somebody and know if their heart is healthy or not. And if you look at the outside of a church, you might not be able to tell. But the only way that there's Holy Spirit life pumping to the rest of it is if at the center you have a heart that's working properly. And we were saying, man, we need at the heart of the city, um, unless we have prayer operating in, in a healthy way. Um, and so that that's kind of our our journey of, of adding a, a prayer center in the heart of our down the heart of downtown the city. And then that's kind of been my job to oversee that that prayer room. One of the jobs. Um, I do here, and um, having musicians and singers and worship leaders, and and uh, this the topic I'm, I'm teaching on today, you know, I, I think is, you know, just a helpful personal topic. But actually, you know, my my urgency on this topic has has really grown over the last few years, in particular, as we have seen um, from COVID and a a mental health crisis sweep across the land and uh, really entering into a time of, of deep darkness, as scripture says, um, in Isaiah 60, and, and you know, where Jesus describes that, that the, the love of many will grow cold uh, and, and they'll be offended. And, and then he says this phrase, this phrase, many's hearts will faint because of fear. Um, and uh, man, I, I, I honestly, I think we're in the beginning of that hour. You just see hearts fainting for fear and just despair, discouragement, depression. And, and within the body of Christ, too, really just this, um, what, we, what we learn first from David in the Psalms of how to live a life uh, where we rejoice in all things that Paul then echoes. Um, and honestly, who better to to teach it than Paul? I mean, who was the apostle of sorrows, and to suffer to 
the, the degree that he did, but to live the life of joy, peace, victory that he did. And this rejoicing in all things and rejoicing in all seasons, I, I think we're turning the page to where this, is, this really is a life and death reality within the church that, that either we know as a church how to rejoice in everything or we will be taken out um, by discouragement, despair, the spirit of Antichrist, which seeks to just wear down the saints. And I mean, I, you know, I don't even, I don't want to like do a hand raise, but, but I think like if we were to be honest, like at least for part of the last two years, how many of us feel worn down? Uh, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, let's just do it. How many of y'all <laughs> feels good? I'm, I'm putting my, my hand right up as well. Um, you know, and that's, that's kind of the, the, the spirit of the age, the, the, the enemy hitting. And so this message of, of rejoicing and, and rejoicing in all things and all, in all seasons, I think, I think worshipers as worship leaders, and I think we have a lot of worship leaders in here, this is the critical piece that the, the days of just being able to sing anointed songs and just being able to kind of pick, you know, Holy Spirit karaoke and seeing what's getting the most hits on YouTube. And if we sing that song, then God's presence comes. And th- those days are, are, are really coming to an end. It's like, man, we have to disciple people how to lead themselves into the presence of God. Like David, to know how, um, not in a fake and a phony way, putting on a, a, a smile that, that is covering all these things up and pretending the pain isn't there, but to how to bring ourselves in sincerity to the Lord, offer ourselves, um, and eventually choose truth and rejoice with the, with the Spirit of God. And so that's what I want to... Uh, talk about and we're going to break down a bit and uh, go ahead and turn in first Thessalonians 5 16 through 18 um this scripture one of my favorites I'll, I'll, I'll always remember coming on this passage um I was in Kansas City and I was reading my Bible and you know when you're 18 years old like you're just like obsessed with like calling like God what are you called me to do what is my calling supposed to be and, and what I meant but by that was, you know, what type of ministry am I supposed to lead? And I just remember reading, and I just came up on that phrase, uh, for this is the will of God for your life. And I was like, whoa. I, like, paused, and I was like, I've been looking for this. This is, this is the will of God for my life. And, and uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of of God in Christ Jesus for you. And I remember the moment where I went from thinking the will of God for my life had to do with external role, had to do with ministry, and and the will of God or what God, I I like to kind of step out of, you know, maybe some cliche language, you know, as a a writer and an artist, I I like thinking this way too, but I, I like to say, you know, the dream of God for my life like what is the, the, what God dreams about when he thinks about my life? That's the will of God for your life, right? It's the, the dream that your father had over you from the time you were born. And, and it doesn't say this is the will of God for your life to have this level of success or make this amount of money or have this amount of impact. He's actually like, no, it's actually a, that you would be and look like Jesus in all circumstance, to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, give thanks in everything. Um, I, I think we could get rid of a lot of our anxiety about what our calling is if, if we realize the dream of God is not what we do externally, but it is, it is the internal response of our heart in all seasons. And if we look Christ-like or if we don't, and the will of God or what God's heart gets excited for you you know, is the authentic response of your heart in the midst of pain and pleasure. And too easy our joy, happiness, delight, pleasure, satisfaction comes from circumstances, but not what the Bible commands us to rejoice in. And the way I like to think of this is that this passage kind of seems confusing at first because if you think about it, it says rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Well, wait a second. You pray, why? Because there's need. <laughs> You have lack. So wait, I'm I'm rejoicing always, which almost implies that I have everything I need. But then I'm praying without ceasing, implying that I don't have what I need. And then I'm back to giving thanks for everything, again, implying that I have what I need. And, and, uh, you know, I've I've thought of it as 
as kind of being a tension, but the way I, I've really seen it as, it's like each one of these phrases are like pedals on a bike. And it's like we're meant to live this rhythm in our life. And I've seen when we, you just pick one of these and fixate on it, and, and you, it, same thing if you just took your left foot on a bike, like, all right, I'm just going to pedal with my left foot. You know, and you go down halfway, and then you have to, like, pick it all the way up. Well, you eventually wouldn't be able to, to, to continue pedaling. And it's the same with our Christian faith. And if we pray without ceasing, without learning to rejoice always, what ends up happening is what we see in Matthew 18 when Jesus says, men ought to pray always and not lose heart. Losing heart is the enemy of, uh, of continuing on in prayer. But if we only pray always... And we don't rejoice in what we have and the breakthrough what's happened. We get so weighed down. We get so discouraged by the lack of answered prayer that we burn out. We get disillusioned and we accuse God of, of not being good and we can fall away. And there's, there's kind of an avoidance of that. But on the other side, we see uh, this idea of rejoice always. Or, you know, it's kind of this idea like, hey, we don't ever need to, like, intercede. Everything belongs. Like, whatever, whatever happens in your life, like, you know, there's no point in praying. It's just God's will is happening and you just rejoice and, and thank him. And we get off into this self-absorbed, self-focused, where our life becomes about us and, the, and the, the things that God's heart is breaking for that he's looking to share with his people. We never give that entry point because we are just living in this place of everything, you know, belongs and doesn't matter. There's really no evil. And, and you see this, if you stunt and you don't keep pedaling on both sides of this bike, then you lose momentum and you, you know, you do that little like handlebar thing that you do and eventually fall down. And, uh, and this, this uh, you, you know, rejoice regardless of emotion, pray regardless of concrete evidence and be thankful in every circumstance. It's meant to just, it, it really is this, this simple gem that Paul gave us that we just kind of skip through. Like I think we miss like, he just gave us a deep secret from the Lord's heart and saying, if you want to understand the will of God or the thing that God dreams about your life, give yourself to this reality. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in everything. And what I love about this is all three of these things you have immediate access to right now. Um, that's the kindness of the Lord. Like the Lord doesn't command something and then he doesn't give us grace to actually walk in it. When the Lord speaks and he says, hey, this is the will of God for your life, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks and everything. Those are profoundly simple realities that even the, the smallest child can grasp and join in on and can give themselves, and, and that, that's amazing. It's, it's what I think of when I think of Psalm 100 that says, enter through the gate of thanksgiving into the court of praise and you know because I don't like wake up in the morning and my heart's not in this place of like great faith and praise like I don't get out of bed being like where's a dead person I'm ready to raise him up like you know like I, <laughs> when I walk into a, a, a you know my time with the Lord like I mean I'm just I'm human I'm groggy I'm waking up I'm cranky about something you know and and the Lord says all right he doesn't say that all right the first thing whenever you get in my presence I want you to groan and travail for 30 minutes <laughs> you know like I want you to raise the dead, you know, like these great acts of faith. And the way I like to think of it, and uh, I'm going to betray the fact that I know absolutely nothing about cars, but uh, you have basically two forms of energy in a vehicle, right? You have the battery, and then you have the combustion system, which comes through gas. The advantage of the battery is that it is instant access. The second you turn that key, the battery gives out energy. Uh, the disadvantage of it is it's not typically powerful enough to propel your car forward in the way gas is. And gas, same thing. The advantage of gasoline is through combustion. It's very powerful, and you can go faster, quicker, farther with it. But the disadvantage of it is you, don't, you can't just turn the key of your car and you're going 80 miles an hour. You have to have these two different energy sources, and the, the, the advantage of the battery is that it's instant. You have access to it. But if you just stop there, you're not going to go very far. But if you try to start with the combustion system, you'll never get it activated and going. You'll just do it in your own strength. It's the same idea with thankfulness 
and faith. The beauty of thanksgiving is the simplicity of it, and it's so simple. It's very much like speaking in tongues. The simplicity in our mind, we're like, this can't be that powerful because it's just so simple. Like, I'm already thankful. Like, I've already done that. I'm thankful for those things. I don't need to say it. No, but say it. Your mind is hardly activated, but it doesn't matter how cranky, groggy, angry, confused. I could be in the worst mental state. I could be in the most spiritual place. At any point, I have instant access to walk through the gate that will lead me to the presence of God through thankfulness. I can just start with thank you, and if I can't even think of anything, I just say thank you for the cross. Jesus, thank you for your blood. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my leaders. And what happens is you turn that battery, and all of a sudden, you're propelled into this place of great faith. And through that faith, we, like, it's, it's impossible to please God or to be heard by God without faith. And so, we're, it's, you know, I like, to, I like to say God doesn't answer prayer. God answers prayers of faith. <clears throat> And we walk through this rejoicing always, giving thanks, and we pedal the bike, and it takes us to this place where all of a sudden we're in this place of faith, declaration, where we're able to proclaim the things. Now let's talk about the things that aren't right, and we begin to pray. And uh, this cycle, and uh, you know, the, it's... You know, it preaches real good, but it, it, when we realize, like, in our life, like, the Lord will continually put us in circumstances to, to teach us, like, okay, is this, is this something that you really believe? And, uh, you know, what we see, uh, what we see in the command, uh, and I'm not going to read through all of them, but the, the command to rejoice always isn't, isn't uh, it's one that we see within, uh, when we see persecution in these moments, it says they rejoiced greatly because they could suffer for the kingdom. And we see this, this odd reality of people rejoicing in the midst of suffering. And it can be very easy to see that and just kind of feel that it's, it's, it's fake. <laughs> like we, we, we all have kind of seen that plastic Christian who's just like has the smile on his face, but he's kind of dead in his eyes or he's like, everything's good, brother. Praise the Lord. Like <laughs> lost my house, you know, my kids don't talk to me, but praise the Lord. Everything's good. You're like, wow, dude, that, that's really tough. Tell me about it. And, oh, it's okay. Praise the Lord. And you're just like, you look dead inside. But, uh, you know, there's, <laughs> uh, maybe that was too much. But, there, you know, we, we can almost assume, like, man, how in the world could you go through suffering like this and have such deep and, and, and profound joy from the inside? And, and you know, <clears throat> this, this process of rejoicing always is is something that I, I feel like is probably for me personally the greatest gift that the Psalms have been able to to offer me um, and I have learned to find myself in the book of Psalms and, and and I encourage you like immerse yourself daily in the book of Psalms uh, Martin Luther says the Psalms is the anatomy of the soul meaning it does not matter where you are there is not a human emotion that cannot be found in the book of Psalms. I don't care if it's been betrayal, if it's heartache, if it's despair, it's depression, if it's joy, if it's breakthrough, if it's victory, if it's visitation, if it's lack. It, it does not, if it's failure, if it's success, it does not matter. Your current emotional state, you can find a Psalm that not only will reach you where you're at, but it'll actually be able to lift you and bring you to the will of God for your life to get back on the bicycle and to be able to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing. And so, you know, how do we do this? And the process of rejoicing and, and suffering. And, and uh, you know, I, I have, you know, for those taking notes, I have three points, kind of how this looks like. When we, when we even talk about spirit and truth, uh, worship, you know, which Jesus says in John 4, the Father is looking for those who worship in spirit and in truth. I love it because we see spirit and truth worship kind of throughout the Psalms. And uh, <clears throat> this is the beauty of prayer in general, is that prayer, uh, prayer leaves no room for pretense. Every, every other form of what we do, um, if we do it, you know, in front of people, we're, it, we can fall so easily into being formulaic. But prayer at its core is just, it's conversation with the Lord. And the Psalms teach us how to leave all pretense. David 
if, if you said the religious spirit to David, he'd be like, huh? <laughs> like, what, what's that? It's like, well, it's when people kind of pretend they have a relationship with the Lord, they don't. He's like, what does that mean? <laughs> like, David lived a lot, like, he would be so confused by that thought and idea. Because to, to David, there was, his life was an open book to the Lord. It was complete sincerity. He, he did not have a reaction and response that was not genuine. And, um, you know, how did he do this? Number one, the process of rejoicing and suffering is we offer our honesty to God. Um, and this is what we, we learn in the Psalms through, through the lament. And, uh, you know, this is where in the Western church, like, we have not really taught people or given room for what it means to really lament with the Lord. And, uh, you know, that's, that's because of our culture. Like, we haven't been that uncomfortable. Like, <laughs> you go to cultures that, that, that suffer, um, you know, they, they, there's no, <laughs> they don't have a grid for someone who, like, wouldn't have lament and suffering in the midst of their worship. But what we see is David continually, when he comes to the Lord, he comes and he brings himself in his sincerity, in who he is with no pretense. And he, he, David just never, he just refuses to put on a show for the Lord. I mean, he just says, I mean, like the things, like it, sometimes it, it would bug me because I would read it and he'd say things about God that aren't true. Like, God, you've abandoned me. You've left me. And he, he'd say these, <laughs> these statements. I'm like, dude, you can't say that. <laughs> Like, it's the Bible, and it's truth, and, and God is so confident in who he is that God's like, oh, I love that. Let's canonize that. Let's print billions of copies so people can read what you, when you poured out your complaint, and you said all the things, the ways that I wasn't coming through, and all those things. Yeah, let's canonize that, and let's give it to people so they can, they can pray. God is, God is not insecure, and, and I've found that, that we, we have a genuine fear and a terror of of opening up our heart to the Lord and and there's something in us that tells us we can't say that or we can't go there we can't do that and I'll be brief kind of sharing this story but even as we're talking rejoicing in 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 suffering a number of how long ago was that about seven years ago um uh, seven years ago, I was in Colorado, long story, went to the Helsers uh, farm, had a great time, but got bit by a mosquito, got meningitis, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, the, the moment, <clears throat> I, had a cu- I had a couple kind of scary moments with it, um, but the first one when it happened, like, my body just kind of, uh, just completely shut down, and I couldn't, couldn't move, I couldn't talk, and then I couldn't really breathe. Um, Rachel was taking me to the hospital. It's kind of a funny story with that, where I'm like in the car and I can't move, or and I'm like, I really think I'm I'm gonna die in that moment. And we're like, Rachel's like praying in tongues. It's like this horrible moment. And we have like this little neighborhood like, like traffic light. And uh, this is for all you rule followers out there. Uh, it's two 25 mile an hour zones, and we had this traffic light that was there, you know, because they didn't trust anybody to just look. And Rachel's like, she drives and she stops because it's a red light and there's nobody coming. And she's like, okay, she's just praying in tongues. And I, I'm stuck and I'm thinking clearly, but I can't speak or move. And I'm like, my wife's trying to kill me. My wife's trying to kill me. I'm like, go run through the red light. And it's just like in her mind, it's like, no, like you, you, like, Hey, if you're going to die here, then you know, that was God's will because he would, he would never have me run this red light. And for me, I, like, had to, I, like, needed a reason to, like, actually stop at that red light. But, um, you know, I, I, I remember in that moment, I heard just such a loud voice, like, you're going to die, and, and felt the, the fear. And, and, you know, it was the, my very first reaction in that moment was, God, what, like, what have I done to deserve your wrath? Like, what sin did I commit? And uh, the next 40 days, um, you know, were really difficult. I wasn't, like, fully in my right mind uh, because meningitis. I mean, it was in my brain, so I was, like, hallucinating. And, and it was very, very confusing, difficult time. But, you know, I, I remember in, in that place, like, I, so many times preaching on who God is and the love of God. And, and you know, I found myself in, that mom- in those moments like really f- having these deep 
questions of doubt of like, are you good? Like, do you love me? Do you have delight in me? Are you, are you even a good God? And, uh, and, you know, I remember this moment and it was on day 37 and I remember it specifically because it was July 4th. It was the day that Kevin Durant left the Thunder and signed with the Warriors. And I was so shocked. It, I like set off this meningitis episode. Like, I, I'm not even kidding. <laughs> I like heard a pop in my head and whatever, and it was just like, it was horrible. I was in like excruciating pain. I was like heartbroken over Kevin Durant leaving and uh, still haven't fully forgiven him. I'm not doing a forgiveness clinic because I need to go to that one. But, um, and uh, I just remember I was just broken and, and I just, the Lord's like, okay, go down to the piano. And it had been like 37 days and I've been bedridden and just everything that I had, you know, had been stripped. Like I'm not, I'm on, like, medicine and steroids, so I'm not, like, a good person at this time. Like, I'm mean to everybody. Like, I'm not doing ministry. All of these things. And when all those things stripped away, I was like, man, I don't know, God, how you feel about me. And I've preached on your love so many times, but in this place, I feel like you hate me and I hate myself. And I remember going down, and the Lord's like, I just want you to play piano. And I just started playing this old Jason Upton, uh, Psalm 23. Uh, and he's just singing, surely goodness and mercy will cover me all the days of my life. And I sung that phrase, and it, it, was like, it was like the heavens ripped open, and there was just like a waterfall of God's love and affection that he poured out on me. And it was at the place of just being at my absolute lowest that I experienced his smile and his delight the most. And I remember even thinking, like, man, this is the season that I, I've... I've accused you more than I've ever accused you and yet you're pouring out your delight and 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 the Lord was just teaching me like Caleb no I've been looking I've been wanting I've been I've been looking for that honesty and and it actually took this intense circumstance for me to actually be able to open up your heart so you could see what was already inside and and I learned something very important that that if 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 those accusations, if they don't come out before the Lord in prayer, then they will come out in my behavior elsewhere. Because there is nothing different between what I believe and, and how I live. And so I can say I believe that God is, is good, but if I don't treat anybody with kindness, then I show that I don't actually believe that God is good. I've never received his kindness for myself, and so I can't show it to anybody else. But we have this idea when we go before the Lord, we can only bring truth of, of, of who he is. And I have learned the, the practice and discipline. The most, the, this, this for me, it, it revolutionized the last three, four years, my time with the Lord, because I always started um, in the word. I, I, I started with, you know, my, my daily reading of passages and go into my prayer and intercession and whatever. And and I, I, I began, I, I noticed that a lot of times I would be distracted or I just, I still was, whatever, wherever my heart was at, you know, I was angry, frustrated, hurt, you know, or happy, good things, busy, all of those things. I, I'd, I'd find myself distracted in, in the word. And, and I made a change, and I'm not saying that everyone needs to, to do this, but for me, I, I started my time with the Lord. I would sit for a minute. And I would just begin to journal where I was at to the Lord. And before I got to the, the scriptures, I would just begin, and this is what I believe when David tells us to pour out our heart before the Lord. And began to do that. And, and I found that it was like, oh my gosh, I really, these things about who you are and your goodness, like, I really have these, these doubts and insecurities and fears that, that I haven't let out. And uh, I'm going to use a, a, a movie reference. Hopefully it doesn't ruin it if you want to see it. But it's been out for like 15 years, so you had your shot. But <laughs> uh, the movie's Inception, and it's by Nolan, one of my, my favorite directors. And he just is brilliant in just the human psyche, heart, whatever. And in the movie, if you haven't seen it, it, it it's, it's all about basically uh, inception is this idea that you can, you, in the movie, you could, if you plant an idea in someone's head, an idea is the most powerful thing that, that somebody can have. And if you plant an idea in their head, you can change, 
history. And so they would try to enter these people's psyche through dreams to plant ideas to kind of shift things. So in this in the movie, this you know rich guy from Asia has a he has a competitor, and the competitor is dying, and so the son is poised to take care of the business. And so he wants he wants uh, to hire this crew to basically plant this idea in his head to break up the company. And so, you know, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of spy-ish, whatever. But in the movie, it just starts to get really profound because they're like, well, what? That's such a big ask. There's only one thought that you could think that would be that big enough to change someone's mind like that. And it's the thought of what his father thinks about him. And in the movie, it's depicted so beautifully because you have basically the layers of his soul are depicted in like these levels. And he has his subconscious, which is fighting against this idea. But you have layer, layer after layer after layer. And this, this guy thinks his dad is disappointed in him. And it's the single, that thought defines who he is, his actions, his behaviors. And in the movie, it's, this thought is depicted. It's, it, he goes through all of the, the safety measures, and there's a room. And in the room, there's a safe. And he opens up the safe, and in that is this idea. And they replace it in the movie, this, this idea that his father's disappointed with his father's approval and love and delight. And, uh, and, and, it, and it shifts the movie. Again, I totally ruined it for you if you haven't seen it. But it unbelievably powerful movie underneath because I have I, found that the, the moments of pain and suffering and difficulty, it's a guided tour into the deepest places in our heart that only pain could open up and expose what was on the inside. If you had asked me a month before meningitis, if I thought that God would punish me because, you know, and, and strike me with an illness because he was mad at me, I would have laughed in your face. <laughs> if you would have said, you know, five or six of the things that I was accusing God of, I would have laughed. I'd be like, I would never believe that or think that. That's not me, you know. And that's kind of how I thought of David when he was writing these things in the Psalms. I was like, I would never think that, Lord. You know, I just, I trust you. <laughs> and, and it took the pain and the difficulty to this, the Holy Spirit's going on this guided tour that's saying, no, no, no. Don't just, don't just come to me and be like, no, I trust you, I love you. No, but you don't. <laughs> I know you want to, but there's, there's, there's lies about who God is that are so deep down and only pain and suffering can reach them. And in that safe, the Lord, like in this meningitis season for me, I had this lie that the father wasn't good or that he only loved me or took care of me based on how I performed for him. And he opened up that safe and he took out that lie and he exchanged it with the truth. You know, I love what Paul prays, casting down strongholds, every lofty thought that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. You have lofty thoughts on the inside. <laughs> and to bring your honesty and sincerity before the Lord, he can, he can handle it. It's okay to, to begin with where you're at. It's okay to tell him, I don't, I don't feel your goodness right now. I know you're a good father, but I don't feel it right now. I don't feel fathered. I don't feel loved. I, it, and, and if you don't bring that out before him in prayer, like I said, it'll come out in, in your behavior and in, in how you live. And the Lord, he delights in it. It's considered worship and praise to him. So much so that, that David prays this insanely risky prayer. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Was David forsaken by God? No. Was there ever a moment that David was forsaken by God? No. For David, that was actually not a true statement. But it so came from the heart of God that Jesus, when he was on the cross, Jesus, who is the word, chose to borrow David's words. And he takes David's raw prayer before the Lord when he was simply pouring out his heart in sincerity. And Jesus says, I'm going to borrow that prayer. And when Jesus was on the cross, it was actually true. The Father had actually turned his back on him. And uh, we, as Christians, um, 
you know, we haven't had a, we, we haven't really known how to do this. We, we, we've, we've been afraid of the, this idea that if we bring anything other than truth and sincerity to the, the truth to the Lord, that, that he is going to be, he's going to strike us down. He's going to be angry with us. But the reality is our, the truth is the only thing that God is looking for us to worship in spirit and truth and sincerity. And, uh, you know, the, there's, there's three languages that, that we learn as, as humans. And, uh, you know, the first language is just the language of an infant where you're born and all you have is sounds and noises and little caws and ah, crying and these little whimpers to communicate what you feel on the inside. And then, you know, eventually we learn the language of education where now we can, we can use words and point out things. And now when we ask for cookie, like we get a cookie. And so we learn the power of kind of learning education. And that's, we're maturing past that baby phase. And then we kind of come to the language, uh, the third language we learn, which is the language of marketing, which is suddenly we, we, we learn that it's not always the best idea to just... Uh, say whatever you're thinking. We were talking about it yesterday. My little sister one time went up to the lady and said, are you pregnant or are you just fat? <laughs> and uh, we, we learn like as kids like, oh my gosh, just saying things as they are is probably not a great idea. I should probably couch it differently. And suddenly we start to figure out when someone asks me how I'm doing, I can say fine and I don't actually have to tell them how I'm doing. And we can present a life that is not entirely true to who we are. And we see this, the marketing, projection as the highest form of communication. But which form of communication is the most honest? Is it not the language of a baby? Is there any pretense in a baby? Are they putting on a show? Are they crying but inside they're not really feeling that thing? No, they don't even know anything other than honesty and sincerity. And it's funny because there's a, there's a time in our life that we uh, speak this language again. We learn projection, but then we go back. Does anyone know what, what, what that time frame is? Uh, <laughs> old people do it. There's a time before that that we start to talk like babies again. And it's when we fall in love, right? Like, I, I'll never forget my, my brother you know, before he was married, he dated a girl named Jamie Schumacher, and uh, I just remember there being in his family's van, and my, my brother is like, you know, 6'3", he's like in the military, he's like overseas right now, and just broad shoulders, you know, super manly, and you know, uh, and we're on the basketball team, and so I'm sitting in the row in front, and you know, he's big, tough, whatever, and I just like, I'm just minding my own business, and I just hear like, hey, good you be? Oh, sweet. Oh, I love you. You're so sweet. And I'm like, what in the heck? Like, I'm t turning around expecting to see, like, an infant baby. And it's, no, it's my brother. <laughs> when it's, it's funny because when we fall in love, we relearn the language of, oh, oh. And we, we make noises and we coo and we ah, why? And we make fun of that, right? Because when you're not in love, there's nothing grosser ever. <laughs> like, you don't want to hear that. But, but when you're in love, is it best to say, you know, you know, I find you desirable and attractive and you are, and use the best language possible. Like, no. The, the return back to the language of a baby it's, it's because love is, in, is, is bringing us back to that place of sincerity. Prayer is the great returning back to the first language. You know what Romans 8 says? The spirit who makes utterance with groanings too deep to be uttered. The deepest prayers, we can't even cheapen them with English language. <laughs> because a liquid prayer of a tear often speaks so much more honestly than the English language of what we have, or a cry, or a groan. And prayer teaches us to go back to this first language where God's like, I don't care about your marketing. 
Like, I don't care if you get up. I mean, Jesus made a point to say, don't be like the long-winded Pharisees who get up and they think they're heard because of their smart words. And I look over at the tax collector who's like beating his breast and saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. And I, I, my heart is drawn to that. And to, to begin to be in a place where we can rejoice, we, we have to know and understand, like, God actually wants us to bring our questions, our pain, our difficulties, our accusations to him, and that he actually receives it as worship. He's actually glorified in it. And unless we do, unless we do that, when that pain comes, it'll reveal those accusations of what we have and what, what is built on the rock and what isn't. Unless we learn to rejoice in all things, then we'll be taken away by the storm. Because when the storm comes, we'll find accusations we didn't know about. But, but accusations we didn't know about are not a big deal if we've learned the transaction of, I know what to do. I just bring this before the Lord. And I exchange this. And I don't bring it before the Lord as a way of just saying, I, you know, I want this and I believe this is true. No, it's to exchange it. It's to expose it, to shine the light on it. And through prayer, I'm able to do that in honesty and sincerity. Uh, number two, we show our weakness to men. How do we rejoice in suffering? Number one, we offer honesty to, the, to, to God. Number two, we show our weakness to men. Another uh, to man, not like the gender of men, but just people in general. Um, it, it, it's funny because this is because of our, we value marketing. It's like when you're doing well, like you want to, or when you're not doing well, you want to put a front on. You know what they did in, in Bible times? It's something that we make fun of because we think that it's juvenile, but sackcloth and ashes. When you were mourning, you literally changed your appearance. You put on clothes, you, you cover yourself in ash and you wailed. Why was that? It was your way of just telling your brothers, sisters, family, friends, hey, I'm not okay. I'm grieving. I'm in a lot of pain right now. It's funny. We look at that. And we're like, ha, ha, that's so stupid. We don't do that now. Well, I think that was a lot more healthy of an approach to grieving in community and family. Because why? It let those who needed to come around those people come around those people. And when we're in pain, this idea of toughing it up and just acting like nothing's wrong is it, we have to break that idea. And not only are we bring our honesty and sincerity to the Lord, but, you know, we have to text our pastors and the people we're running with and our leaders and saying, hey, I'm really, I'm really struggling. I'm not having self-control over my thoughts right now. I have accusations about God. And, and the process of being able to rejoice involves us living lives of openness and sincerity within community. And if we, if, if we don't do that, we will be dragged down in, in isolation. And then, and then number three, <clears throat> we hear and command truth back to our souls. And David does this so insanely well. When David pours out his complaint, but you know, most of the time he ends his psalm with, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord. Why so downcast, O oh my soul? Put your hope in God. See, David gives us the gift in the psalms that the world can never do. The world's great at finding us in our pain, right? If you're depressed, man, I got a playlist for you. Like, I got songs that, oh, I just, oh, man, that, I, that song gets me. I feel it. And the world can, can, can find you in that, but it, it can't lead you out of that place. But the Psalms, the life of rejoicing and, and prayer, it teaches us. We can find ourselves wherever we're at in the Psalms, but then we are led to offer our sincerity to the Lord open up before our, our brothers and sisters and then being led to truth to the point where it's like, okay, it's, it's time to get up. And that's what we see. Jesus found the woman in adultery in the dirt. He was gentle and kind enough and to, to find her where she was at, but he didn't leave her there. He picked her up and he said, okay, don't sin anymore. I've given you a gift. Now walk in, in this freedom. And we, we learn in this place, like, okay, like there's a season to grieve, and then there's a season to simply get up and, and, and to lead and to be the person that God's called us to be by declaring truth. My favorite story that does this in the Bible, I, w I won't read it to go into it, but it's Joab and, and David, and uh, it's the story of Absalom. 
and uh, which is such a heartbreaking story, right? Because it, it's ultimately David's poor leadership and fathering that causes this crisis. Because Amnon, uh, you know, rapes his half-sister, and David doesn't do anything about it. And so Absalom takes justice in his own hands, kills Amnon, and, and uh, David banishes him. And, uh, and then eventually he brings him back, but he doesn't let him in his, his gates. He doesn't deal with the problem. And so, so Absalom's chilling at the gates, and he's like, you know, hey, how'd it go in there? Like, you get what you want from the king? And they're like, no, you know, they said, well, if I were king, then this is what I would do. And it says that Absalom swayed the hearts of the people. And eventually, you know, this uprising happened. They kick him out. You know, we know the story. Absalom gets caught up in his hair, dies. And uh, they're coming back to the city, and the, they've, there's this huge victory, but David is just mourning. He's saying, Absalom, Absalom, oh, my son, oh, my son. And he's mourning because he lost his son, but he's, he's also really mourning because he knows it's his fault. If he had confronted Absalom, if he had taken care of this and done his job and rolled, this wouldn't have happened. But he comes back in, and the soldiers are ashamed, and the people are ashamed. And, and David is sulking and grieving, and Joab comes in. It's one of my favorite scriptures because he literally says this phrase in it too, where he, he said, you, you have shamed the men who have given their lives for you. Uh, and he's, he, he, literally, he, he literally says, uh, and I swear to God that if you don't go out there, this night will be worse for you than any su- at suffering you have ever encountered in your life you get your butt up and you go take your place in the gate and David and it says David got up he finished his grieving and he went and he sat at the gate and he took his place and uh, I love that that scripture because there are the seasons and the moments to be in the grief to be in the despair to be in the pain to really process with the Lord to offer your heart and sincerity and then there's time for the, the Psalms and, and the Lord and other people to be the Joab in your life. that says, look, I know you're in pain, but it's time to get up. This isn't who you are. You're the king. You're the leader. This is God's appointed position for you. Get up and take your seat. And that's what the world can never do. <laughs> they don't have, they can't find you in that. And that right there, if I could just pick a story of what that means to rejoice always and to give thanks in everything. Pick yourself up. I know that it's difficult. I know that you're in pain. But this is the truth, and it's time to agree and, and walk through that. And, uh, you know, our goal should really be, like, if God's dream is the response of our heart, you know, that then, then we should just constantly be evaluating, okay, how did I respond? And, and let me just say, there's a difference between your reaction and your response. Like, <laughs> your reaction is just typically a result of just where you're at. Like, if you're hungry at the time, if you're in a bad mood, <laughs> like, your reaction is just the knee-jerk thing that comes out of you. But what is your response after that? And Paul, he resolved in his heart that my response will be to put my foot on one of these pedals. I'm going to rejoice always. I'm going to pray without ceasing. I'm going to give thanks in everything. And, uh, you know, it's why it's so valuable is Jesus is, we we see this reaction. And I I think this is so important, this idea of being able to rejoice and do it in in sincerity. Why? Because of the heaviness of the times. What does it mean to be holy? You can answer. It's not just rhetorical. To be set apart, right? To be different. How does the world look and feel right now? Heavy. Sad. If your religion looks heavy and sad right now, Like, if your idea of holiness is heaviness, sadness, guess what? You're not holy. You look exactly like the world right now. You want to look holy right now? It looks like this doesn't make sense. This is confusing joy. Wait, what? You and your family are thriving right now? You you lost your, your job. Like you're in economic difficulty, but then when, when I came to your house, everyone's laughing. There, there's a joy. There's a happiness. There's a love. I don't get it. This is confusing. Oh, that's confusing? This is, this is what the kingdom of God is. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Like Our joy isn't determined in our circumstances. 
COVID happens, if government does this, we lose this economic thing. No, as a family or as an individual, we know how to not be moved and we have a joy that is uh, uh, inexpressible that the world cannot take away and that, that, that doesn't make sense. And we as a church, we need a witness of, of a church that rejoices in all things. It is what will catch the world's attention. I mean, it's what caught Paul's attention. They're stoning this guy, Stephen, and he's, he's thinking he's going to get this fear and this whatever, that, and Paul's going to get the satisfaction out of Stephen. But Stephen's he's got a smile on his face. He's getting pelted with stones. He's like, I see Jesus. I'm going to go be with him. And he's got a smile. He's got joy and expressible on his face. You better believe that haunted Paul when he left <laughs> that circumstance. I mean, we, you hear accounts of martyrs singing. And it, what is it about? Is it, is it the fieriness of their preaching in the moment that haunts their oppressors? Or is it the smile that rests on their face? Is it the song that they're singing with joy in the midst? We saw it. Uh, recently, I can't remember how many of the the Christians that were executed uh, on that video a couple of years back, but we heard the, the the singing from their hearts in the midst of the most difficult pain, and it it is the per, it's it's the most intimate demonstration of the power of the cross that that I believe exists, the ability to genuinely, authentically rejoice in the midst of suffering shows the beauty of what Jesus did on the cross. More than preaching, even, even, the, even the, the power of the cross or what, what the cross did to deliver us and save us, there needs to be a demonstration of that power. And, uh, you know, if, if we're going through rocky and difficult seasons, but people look inside the church and, and the church is more emotionally unhealthy than the world (laughs) and unless we get delivered of our religion unless we start to understand like man we have to learn this lifestyle this cycle of rejoicing always praying without ceasing giving thanks and everything you know then 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 we're going to lose our our witness and so um you know how do we how do we do this and uh you know i want to bring us back to some simplicity in this, even as we close and, 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 and we, we end. Um, but rejoicing turns the wall of resistance into gates of entrance. Um, I love the Isaiah 60. Violence shall no more be heard in your land. Devastation or destruction within your borders. You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. I love this because salvation is God's job and praise is mine. And do you know what the gates are made of in the city, the New Jerusalem? Pearls. And how are pearls formed? Irritation, suffering, difficulty. The walls are salvation. That's the gold that inlays the city, but the gates are pearls. And the gates are the, the entry points and the, the, the ability to, in the midst of irritation and pain, to offer the sincerity of praise is quite literally the gates that we will enter through in eternity, in the eternal city. The walls of resistance that become gates of praise. We are running into some walls. And man... Unless that shout rises up from the people, unless that authentic response of praise, then we are going to keep marching around the same walls, praying for God to make them fall. And he's like, I kind of want you to shout at it. Sing, O barren woman. Shift the season with your singing. I love that phrase, sing, O barren woman. It's so, it's so intense and vivid. It's, it's the idea of a, a woman who is not able to give birth, but she's like in her rocking chair with a crib next to her, singing a lullaby, even though there's no baby there. Because it says, I know I'm going to sing my way out of this barrenness into the truth. 
And knowing in the rhythm of, of rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks and everything. As we pedal that bike, we know the moments to pray without ceasing, to pour out our complaint, to offer our sincerity. But then we know that moment to rejoice always and saying, okay, I'm hitting this wall. But it's time to turn this wall of resistance into a gate of praise. The wall is salvation. That's, that's God's job. But the gate is praise. That's my job. <laughs> that's my job. And as worship leaders, y'all, we need to be discipling our people. If they need the worship set to lead them through this every time, then we failed. Because what happens when we can't gather? <laughs> you know, what, what we found out was there's a lot of people that didn't know how to lead themselves into the presence of God. And gosh, we've gotten so good at it, right? Like the, the songs are so insane. The lights look amazing, like the atmospheres. And we have these Mary of Bethany's are so anointed leading worship that are breaking there that you can just come to a weekend worship service and you can enjoy the fragrance just like the disciples did and think that you, you broke open your alabaster jar, but you just enjoyed the fragrance and the sacrifice of somebody else. And then when the shaking happens and you don't get that environment anymore and you don't know how to lead yourself, you don't know how to simply walk through the gate of thanksgiving into the court of praise, you will crumble. And I, it's, it's sad, but we saw that. All of us in our churches, we saw people that just removed, sometimes even a few months from being in the corporate gathering and their faith went because they didn't learn how to do this and then disciple other people how to do that. And for me as a worship leader, man, I, I don't, I don't want to build it on my gifting and anointing. I want to get to the place where I'm not even needed. It's like we all know how to go through that gate. We all know how to go through that gate of thanksgiving into the court of praise. We know how to lead ourselves into the presence of God, but then we disciple people to do that in a way that's countercultural to the world. It doesn't make sense. And, and it, the simplicity of it, like we, we cannot be afraid of the power of the simplicity of it. And the, the, the world needs to see joy. And if, if we don't have joy, then we're not going to have strength to, to make it. But if we want to be holy, if we want to look different than the world, then we have to have a joy that does not make sense. It does not matter where on that cycle, and that's what Paul is saying. It doesn't matter if I've been shipwrecked or beaten with rods or whatever. I'm just, I'm learning to rejoice in all things. And uh, I'm saying, like, Lord, I need to learn this discipline. And, and when I, I, I fail at it a ton, <laughs> when I overreact, my reaction sucks. I go back to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I failed. I missed the reaction again. But can we... Can we run through that again? I want to give a different response. And I had this powerful moment. Uh, close with this, and then I'm going to pray for us. Um, maybe a year or two ago, and uh, the Lord in this just moment of worship and prayer, he brought me back to this moment in my life where I had just, I had not responded the right way to something. And it wasn't like I was just seeing it and whatever. There, I actually was brought to the, the place of grief and conviction. I actually felt heaviness and grief over how I responded. And then the Lord's like, okay, now I want you to respond. I was like, what do you mean? Like, that already happened. And the Lord brought me to it, and he pulled this response out of my heart that was the correct response years later. And I got a do-over. <laughs> I got a do-over. This time I got to rejoice. This time I got to just release what was in, in my heart. And, and I'm, I'm trying to do this just as a, as a discipline. You know, when I blow it, when my reaction, when I'm not rejoicing and suffering, when I'm complaining, when I'm, you know, not forgiving, and I'm doing all those things. <laughs> but I'm going before the Lord. And a lot of times just in that little journal time. And I'm saying, okay, this was my reaction. Show me what lies I'm believing about you. And... Teach me. I, I, I want to learn to respond another way because I, I have to look like you. And unless I learn to, to rejoice and have a heart of praise and turn walls of resistance into gates of praise, like, 
I'm not going to make it myself, nevertheless be able to lead the people of God, but I want to be able to lead a congregation where it's like, man, you, I, we're going to be here, we're going to need to gather on Sunday, but it doesn't matter. If you go through something on Thursday, you're like, oh, I know what to do. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in, in everything. I know how to walk through the gate of thanksgiving into the court of praise no matter what. And that, that activation of thankfulness turns to faith. To in the courts of praise, I'm able to see, hear, understand what God is saying and doing and declare that. And the atmosphere shifts when I begin declaring that truth for other people. And they learn, whoa, that guy got somewhere that I don't know how to get there. Teach me how to go there. As Paul says, it's simple. It's actually the dream of God for your life. I don't care about the other stuff that, that you obsess about, but I do care. Are you able to rejoice always? Can you give thanks for, for anything and, and everything? And I remember the time I, I struggled with insomnia, but I remember one time the Lord was like, I want you to write out what you're thankful for in the midst of this. I was like, this doesn't make sense. I'm not thankful. I'm annoyed about this. We, you know that I'm annoyed about this. I tell you all the time. And I ended up writing down 37 things. And it was like songs I've written, prophetic words I've gotten, revelation in the scripture, intimacy with the Lord, being, becoming more reliant on him, being humbled more. <laughs> like, it, I couldn't believe it, but it was, it was this shift of even in something that I'm not stoked on and, and I don't necessarily love, I can find Gratitude and thanksgiving that will lead me to the court of praise where I'm actually able to declare who, who God is. So I'm going to pray for us. Um, so glad you all are here. I'm just excited for these times in prayer and in worship and just have a lot of faith for what God is going to do. And I just want to, I just want to bless you guys and, and just pray in the midst of this season, like, man, we, we are just in need of the joy of the Lord. So, Father... Thank you for this amazing group uh, that you've gathered, Lord. You're praying church. I'm just grateful that we get to gather like this. And, and um, Lord, we, we are in need of the joy of the Lord. Lord, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And uh, we're sorry where we've placed our joy and our hope in things that are not you. And, Lord, you are realigning our joy and our hope. You're using our disappointment, Lord to help us see where we've placed our hope and our faith in things that are incorrect. <laughs> and we put our joy back in our salvation. And Lord, we ask that you would, you would teach us this rhythm, that we would pedal on this bike of rejoicing always, praying without ceasing, giving thanks in everything. Lord, that, that, that is, if it's the dream of your heart is our authentic response of love in all seasons, God, would you make it the dream of our heart too? God, that maybe our dreams need to realign a little bit more toward your heart, Lord. That being Christ-like, being the fragrance of Jesus, maybe we're too concerned with trying to sound like Jesus instead of wanting to smell like Jesus. Becoming the fragrance of Christ. The undeniability that somebody has been with Jesus is they carry the same scent the fragrance of intimacy and love. And Lord, we ask that we would become that, the fragrance of Christ. Not as men lacking sincerity as some, but of those who are of sincerity. Not those peddling the gospel as some, as Paul says, but those of sincerity, men of sincerity. And Lord, just, I just ask even that you would give us those songs of joy. Lord, that we would release songs that would actually declare joy and shift the season, Lord. Lord, even as we have felt the pressures of despair and depression and heaviness, Lord, men's hearts fainting for fear, Lord, we are in need. Just give us prophetic choruses and songs, God, even childlike, joyful phrases, Lord. Teach us to do this with our kids, Lord, that, that we would even be able to disciple our own children. And what, is, what does it mean to be able to rejoice always and give thanks in everything? What does this rhythm look like, Lord? We want to be those who carry your fragrance. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.